Well, I think, I think we look at mountains and we see rock and snow, and we know that snow is really water, and that when it becomes ice is pretty solid, and we know that ice can melt, but we don't really think that much about rocks, about lava. And so when you think about the fact that we have a string of volcanoes starting up in Baker, all the way down to Lassen, all of which at one time or another were hot, hot spots. And some of them still are hot spots. And so I think my interest is the combination of the melting of the ice, the melting of the snow, and the fact that the rock is, you know, it's unreliable. And Steve and I used to climb all over um, Hood uh, from, the, from the north side because his mother grew up there and he grew up wandering around there. And so when we got married, we started hiking and climbing the mountain. And um, we had a feeling of confidence about what it was like. But as the ice started to melt, we, we were forced to admit that a great deal of Hood is rubble. It's rubble because of the way the volcano works, and it's also very dangerous to climb on steep areas that have lost their ice. And the very top of Hood uh, has lost a lot of ice, which functioned as glue to hold together this rubbly, broken up lava and tephra and all the, all the debris that comes from a volcano. So there you go. And the thing I like about lava is that it's hot, and then it cools down and then it's stiff and hard and that's like my paint. But, but my paint is never hot. It's just liquid. It's liquid and then it's not liquid. You know what I mean? I don't think there's a conflict between the abstraction and, and the representational reality. It's just that you think of a rectangle, right? And, and when I worked, worked with big swaths of paint in which I made a structure which, which was sort of bulging and pushing against the edges of the rectangle as an abstraction, I didn't really think about the horizon. I didn't really think about the top part of it being related to the sky. I didn't think about the bottom part of it being related to the Earth, but gravitationally, when you stand in front of an abstraction, you still have that sense of gravity. The bottom part feels like it's supporting, and the top part feels like you can see behind it. Uh, but anyway, so, so with a mountain, you've got these places at the top that are pretty much the sky, and you've got the places at the bottom that are pretty much the earth and then you got the mountain in between so you get to play around in between all those things but I'm always looking for shapes I'm always looking for the shapes that I think are, are jostling up against other shapes and that's not too different in an abstraction and in a representational landscape I'm not looking detail 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 I'm looking shape and shape often has a gesture whether you actually swing your arm through it or not it has a gesture I think it's a continuation. It was a slow process, uh, and I have sketchbooks full of things that show the sh that show the process. And for years, I was making drawings of the mountain just out of my back pocket, sort of guilty, you know, guilty. I, I told Mel Katz, I said, I got the god of abstraction over my shoulder, frowning at me because I'm making these drawings. However, I made them because. The complexity of the shapes inside the mountain, the way it broke down into many different uh, alignments, and the way certain sections were lit from the side and became all bright, and the other sections became dark. I mean, and that changed through the day, and it changes through the season. So all of these things made me want to, um, they made me want to draw it. And then about 10 years ago, I said to Steve, confidently, I'm going to make a series of paintings that, that are cubist versions of Mount Hood. And he said, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> and I thought, 
Sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, it turns out it's really hard, and that's probably why I started doing it and kept on doing it, because it, it wasn't obvious where those edges were. You know, you got a plane coming this way, you got a plane coming this way. Where do they meet? How are they lit? Do they lean this way? Do they lean this way? Or are you making strokes going the other? You know, there's a lots of things. And by the way, I brought this. Maybe this is a good time to talk about this. This was a tool I had in 1990 when I made this huge painting for the convention center. This is a mud rockers tool and it's 10 inches wide and it has several advantages. One is you can mix a color here and a mix a color here and then you can mix a middle color and you can take the whole thing and put it right on the painting. And the other is you don't need a palette because if you work in acrylic like I do, a palette just gobbles your paint up and you can't get it off and you end up wasting this huge amount of paint. In this case, um, I can mix a color, change my mind, mix another color, change my mind again and mix another color, use all those colors, and then I can, then I can use up what's left on a, on a bare painting that just I wipe my brushes off on. I do that all the time. I wipe my brushes off on the same painting I'm working on. I have a color here and then I, I have leftover, I put it down there and then later on I cover it up. Anyway, palette and tool together, okay? Yeah, Talking Leaves is a book uh, by, uh, was it Craig Leslie? It's, I think it's Craig Leslie. I wish I knew, his, remembered his first name. He's a writer, he's an Indian writer, and he had a collection of stories about um, why the Indians were so fascinated by written words. And here I am, I'm making a decoration for a library, right? So we've got the written word in the library. And the real question is, when the Indians realized that the Europeans that came in and sort of took over had a way of communicating with each other when they weren't there. Uh, I, think, I think that, and the Cherokee, the top Cherokee uh, chief, I will remember his name in a minute, shame on me, um, Pont, not Pontiac, another car name, <laughs> not Chevrolet either, but anyway, the top chief, he started making uh, an effort to actually make words that could be written down that were Indian words. And so my interest in talking leaves, the Indians called the, the letters and books and things that were written by the white people talking leaves. That's what they called them. So that was, that was the intellectual framework, but the actual painting has, um, at the bottom of the painting, it has an open book with a bookmark, which is shaped like a pointed ellipse. And then it has a big lollipop tree, and then it has a big cloud shape, and then it, so it has very abstract shapes in it, but the suggestion is these all stand for things that we see in the world. Oh, why, why do I frame? Yeah, well, I, I like what, um, Hank Pander said, he said, if you're gonna, if you're gonna take a shape off the canvas, really take it off the shape, the canvas, or if you're gonna keep it inside, stop before it looks like you don't know what you're doing. But <laughs> I always thought that was a pretty, pretty, pretty good piece of informa information or advice. But, but then when I would put a plain little, little piece of framing, and, and you might say, well, why do you need to frame them at all? A lot of people don't. I need to frame them because I paint them flat on the wall, and I paint them flat on the wall because I need a hard background because I'm putting so much paint on. So when I stretch them, the staple marks and other things are obvious, so I have to frame them to cover that. If I paint it on a stretch canvas, this is just the logistics of how I paint. By the way, you learn how to paint based on what you want the paintings to look like. And I like to be able to trowel on paint and I can't do that on a stretched canvas because it makes potholes. No good. Where did we, oh, so that's why I have, that's why I have painted edges because I don't like that sudden jolt between 
the, the edge of the painting and the, and the outside world. The frame divides the painting from the outside world wherever it's hanging. And I just found that little electric strip of different colors to be a nice transition. Sometimes people don't even see it. Other times they do. Oh yeah, oh absolutely yeah, there is. And, and I, th I think that part of what happened with the Midland Library, it was the first commission I had after my big painting for the convention center, which had fish shapes in it. But it was a very abstracted kind of fish shape. It, basically, it was my favorite pointed ellipse with a triangle on the end. So you got a pointed ellipse like this, and then you got a triangle, well, that's a fish, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't deal with the twisting of the fish. It doesn't deal with the light hitting the fish. It doesn't deal with anything other than a very symbolic flat thing. But having done that, uh, and having included around the outside edge of that big painting for the convention center, all these names of the rivers in Oregon, and, and including those rivers, I thought was instructive because some of those names are Indian names that have been translated into English and the others are Indian names translated into French. And then some are plain old French names like Deschutes. And some of them are just, you know, the Columbia. Well, where did that name come from? There's a good question. Both, both, and, and uh, you might guess that the little paintings have more brushwork, but I also paint with brush, if I, if I make a trowel shape that has a s sort of s smushy quality to it, and then I want another shape next to it to be distinctly different, sometimes I will load up a fresh, clean brush with extra paint so I can come up and you know cover or obliterate the edge, or vice versa, I might, go inside of, a, of a, a trial mark that's 10 inches wide and take the edge of it that's ragged and, and brush it into softness. You know, there's all kinds of things you do with a brush that you, you can't do with this, but there's all kinds of things you can do with this that you can't do with a brush. So I do both. And um, sometimes I, I look at, like I look at this one and there's, there's just a total mixture of, of brush and trowel in that little one. This one, you can, you can see the areas where, where I've slathered paint on and there was wet paint underneath it, puddly paint. Well, this is a good time to, to get these, these out. Um, I, I, I use both. I use both drawings and photos. So, so I remember, here's another quote from somebody. I remember George Johansson saying to us when we were students, you can use a photo, you just can't use it slavishly. I mean, obviously some people do use photos slavishly, but the point is the photo helps you remember certain things. But the drawing reminds you, make a drawing like this, it's a very complicated bunch of stuff in that mountain. And every time I go to work on a drawing, I think, how the heck am I going to do it? You know what I mean? But, but that issue of trying to get proportions right with your own eye and your own hand without the camera doing it for you. The camera has, is an Augenblick, an eye blink. It basically takes the whole picture and it solves all the, um, the format problem and it solves all the proportion problems. But what George is saying, don't use it slavishly. In other words, don't take for granted that outside edge of the photo and don't take for granted the proportions. So it says that's the proportion, but you can change it. You know, so I, I think it's important to do both. Here's some rocks. So these are, these are the rocks that I collect and then I put other things behind them. That's my kitchen table work, more rocks. So these are, these are rocks that I collect. Oh, this is better. 
This is a big rock with little rocks on top of it. <laughs> anyway, so, so my studio practice involves photos, newspaper articles, reading, um, geology and history, and sketching and drawing and painting. All of it. All of it. I don't know if I've, I've missed anything there. Uh, I have all kinds of things that inspire me. Here's another one, look at this. The same, the same idea. The rocks on top of a bigger rock. Ooh, better yet, this is the tablecloth with the rocks. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, these are helpful. Uh, and this is, this is, after I did the drawing of the rocks, I went outside and sat and did this. So, so you, you can see somehow how drawing one thing affects how you draw another thing, and then you can sort also see how drawing something can get translated into a painting. Um, and this is very complicated. This is December 2018. Here's a little slightly more soft, soft one. But anyway, you, you get the picture. Here's another one that I use white. One thing about using off-white paper, this is pale, beige, brownish, is you can put white out on top of it to make the white parts of the snow pop. It, and here it has a little piece of text that says in the middle of the glacier, informative poem. <laughs> That's another thing. It says black, green, trees, shadow, knife-like, light, pure, blue sky, sharp, bright, yellow, white, March 17, 2017. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. But that's studio practice. I think studio practice is each person develops a studio practice that works. And I remember, here's another thing Mel Katz once said, it takes 10 years to learn how to use a studio. But I would say it takes your whole life to learn how to use a studio. But 10 years to use a studio, you're learning how to motivate yourself, you're learning how to push yourself, you're learning how to space out your deadlines or hopefully get some more deadlines, and you are learning how to criticize yourself without destroying things. I, I think that teaching is helpful for that. Uh, I always found teaching to be helpful because if I was trying to figure out what to say to a student about how to somehow make this painting a little bit more convincing that they were working on, I could use it for myself. Learning how to verbalize what didn't seem right to me. And of course, there's always room for arguing. And that's part of what makes teaching important is that a teacher tells a student what they think and the, and the student says, I don't agree. And then you have this argument. And, and whether the student agrees or not, it's a good discussion, you know? And I, I think, some teachers are mostly praise, you know? Paul Missile comes to mind. He was a wonderfully positive person. He couldn't bear to have anybody be criticized. And, and you know, maybe that's good. Maybe that's good. Maybe we need all kinds of teachers. <laughs> <laughs>